Okay, hello again and uh, welcome everyone back to the, the Microstructure Exchange. Today we're very excited to have Eric Budish here from Chicago Booth and he's going to talk about the high frequency trading arms race. Um, before we leave the word to, to Eric, just a uh, uh, couple of uh, small announcements. Um, uh, as most of you will know, we have a call for paper, papers ongoing. That's for seminars in the fall, starting September. And uh, this is open to everyone uh, with uh, microstructure related uh, papers. So please submit your papers. Uh, the deadline is in end of June. And uh, all the information is on our website. So just go there and there's a, a, a big link on top of the page uh, that you can't miss. Uh, so we look forward to see your submissions. And uh, uh, I'll also mention that uh, we have a, a nice talk next week as well. That will be by, by Mao Yi uh, at the usual, uh, usual time. So uh, uh, before we start here, uh, let me remind you about the format for the webinar. It is... Uh, 45 minutes presentation that includes a couple of uh, stops for questions and uh, uh, you're welcome to type your questions in the in the zoom Q&A function and uh, you can also upvote uh, other questions that uh, that you're interested in and you can also comment on the, on the questions and um, uh, Eric's co-authors uh, uh, Matteo Aquilina and Peter O'Neill uh, will be here, I think, to also answer questions uh, uh, in, in that chat function in the Q&A. Then after the 45 minutes, there will also be the opportunity to uh, raise your hand and uh, ask your questions uh, by voice. And uh, uh, we will do that for 15 minutes or so, and then the official seminar ends. But Eric has promised to stay on for another 15 minutes if, uh, if there are many questions. So with that, uh, let me uh, leave the screen to Eric. Uh, uh, great, well, thank you very much for the, uh, the invitation and thank you very much for just or or organizing this uh, virtual seminar series through silver linings and uh, in, in, in the lockdown. Um, this is joint work with Matteo Aquilina and Peter O'Neill, both of whom are at the UK Financial Conduct Authority uh, the usual disclaimer applies. This is not an official point of view of the, of the FCA. There's a the disclaimer text is in, uh, in our paper. This paper represents our, our views and errors, errors are, are, are our own. So Michael Lewis famously described the uh, US stock market uh, as rigged uh, for the benefit of insiders and particularly high frequency uh, trading firms. Uh, High frequency trading uh, advocates of various stripes, the Modern Markets Initiative being one that I quote here, um, dismissed the Lewis book as a, as a novel or you know, work of fiction. Uh, the MMI described speed-based arbitrage uh, as a quote, uh, myth. <clears throat> um, my own past work joint with uh, Peter Crampton and, and John Shim published in 2015 suggests a slightly different perspective which is that the market is, uh, is misdesigned. So in that paper, we show that under the current, uh, current market design used widely across financial exchanges around the world, high frequency trading firms will endogenously choose to do two things. So first, provide liquidity to investors. And second, uh, snipe steal quotes or engage in, in latency arbitrage. Um, providing liquidity is useful, a useful function in the market. Um, latency arbitrage or sniping stale quotes uh, we show is harmful. And more, more precisely what we show is that whenever there's new public information in the market that moves an asset's price, so think a, a change in the price of a highly correlated asset or a change in the price of the same asset on a different, uh, on a different trading venue, there will be a race to respond. And with continuous time, serial processing of messages, uh, even public information creates uh, creates rents because someone's always first uh, to respond uh, to the public signal. So the second function, sniping stale quotes, harms the first first function. 
uh, sniping is, is, is like a tax. It imposes a cost. Uh, it's like a tax on liquidity provision. And, and this is true whether or not the provider of liquidity uh, is themselves an ultra fast trader or a, 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 a slower market participant. Our paper uh, then discussed a modification to the market design that eliminates latency arbitrage. Uh, we called this frequent batch auctions. Um, times discrete, very, uh, orders are very frequently batch processed using uniform price auctions. And the, 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 this market design preserves the useful function of sophisticated algorithmic trading uh, while eliminating sniping uh, and a socially wasteful uh, arms race for speed. Uh, empirical evidence on the magnitude of sniping or latency arbitrage has been, uh, has been elusive. So in that past Um, Matteo, Peter, and, and other co-authors provided a study uh, of uh, latency arbitrage between uh, exchanges and, and dark pools, a, a stale reference price kind of latency arbitrage strategy. The challenge with both of these studies is how to extrapolate from a single trade the researcher knows how to measure to an overall sense, uh, sense of magnitudes. There have been several studies that have, have used have, have used TAC-like data to look at price discrepancies for the same symbol across uh, venues. And I, I cite a, a few of, of, of them here. Um, the challenge with this approach, and the Ding Hanna Hendershot's very upfront about, about the limitations of this approach, is our first, which, which discrepancies that you'd see in the TAC data are actually exploitable or exploited? So no, Timestamps are noisy. It takes time to, uh, to, to take information from one market and use it to trade on another market. And then the second challenge with this approach is that it considers only within symbol arbitrage. So it actually miss a lot of latency arbitrage opportunities. For example, it would miss latency arbitrage between uh, futures and ETFs or other highly correlated but distinct, uh, distinct assets. And in, in the absence of comprehensive empirical evidence on latency arbitrage, it's hard to assess its importance. Is, is the market uh, rigged as, as alleged or claimed by Michael Lewis? Is, is latency arbitrage a myth as uh, claimed or alleged by, by HFT advocacy groups? And, and it's also hard to do cost benefit analysis on market design reforms like frequent batch auctions or, or like sensibly designed speed bumps that are the, a, a goal of which is to eliminate latency arbitrage and it's, it's, it's cost, the cost it imposes on, uh, on liquidity. So what we're gonna do in this paper is we use a simple new kind of data to shed light on high frequency trading generally and latency arbitrage specifically. And this data is called uh, message data. So limit order book data, which I presume many of you on this, uh, on this Zoom are familiar with, provides the complete play-by-play -play of the order books. Every new limit order that posts to the book, every canceled order, every trade, and so forth. Timestamps are often quite good, especially with direct feed data. Um, many researchers have, have obtained limit order book data that has uh, firm IDs, whether anonymized or, or bucketed you know, with a zero one flag for whether the firm's an HFT, that kind of thing. But what limit order book data is missing is messages that don't affect the state of the order book because they fail. So if, if I attempt to snipe a stale quote, but my attempt is too late, I go, I'll get bounced back with a, a too late message. So if I use an immediate or cancel message that can't execute, I'll get bounced back with a, with a message that my, my, my order can't execute. That does not leave us a, a signature in limit order book data. If I attempt to cancel a steel quote, but I'm slightly too late because you've already aggressed against me, that does not leave a, a trail in a limit order book data set. So the simple insight of our study is that these failure messages are, are a direct signature of speed sensitive trading. Um, the, the essence of a race is that there's winners and losers, but in limit order book data, you can't see the fact that there were losers. You can, you can see that there was a trade, but you can't see that there were multiple other firms trying to execute the same trade at essentially the same time. 
So we obtained uh, message data from the London Stock Exchange by a request under Section 165 of the Financial Service and Markets Act. We got data for a nine-week period uh, in the fall of 2015 for all, all stocks in the FTSE 350. Uh, timestamps in our data are accurate to the millionth of a second. Um, and the timestamps are at the, at the right location in the exchange's uh, systems architecture. I'll describe this in a few, in a few slides. So the, the right timestamps for measuring speed races. Uh, we have participant IDs that are anonymized. We do not see who's who, who's who in the data, but we can track firms uh, over time. And, and what this data allows us to do is to directly measure how often are there how often are there latency arbitrage races? How long do they take? Uh, how many participants are in races? Um, what's the diversity or concentration of winners and losers of races? And what are, what are the economic stakes per, per race and, uh, and overall? So let me on this slide give you a preview uh, of our main results. So, so first, we find that uh, races are frequent, about one per minute per symbol for FTSE 100 stocks. That's analogous to the S&P 500. Uh, in the US. Uh, second, we find that races are fast. The, mo the modal race, the difference between the winner and the loser of the race is between Um, race participation is concentrated. So the top six firms in our data uh, win 82% of all races and, and also lose 87% of all races. Again, the essence of a race is there's winners and losers trying to do the same thing at the same time. Um, races are small per race. About the, the typical race is worth about half a tick and worth a few British pounds. Um, but because of the volume, it, it, it adds up to an arguably meaningful quantity. So uh, in the next few bullets, I'll, I'll quantify the overall sums in a few different ways. So one is it, it adds up to a meaningful proportion uh, of price impact. So races are about a third of price impact in this data set and about a third of the effective spread in this data set. Um, and divide by just all trading volume as the denominator. And this ratio is 0.42 basis points. So point, you know, basis point is one one hundredth of a percent, as you all know, so point, point 0.42 um, point times that. So le less than one one hundredth of one percent. Um, but eliminating this 0.42 basis point uh, cost imposed on liquidity would reduce the cost of liquidity in the market by 17, uh, by 17 percent. And then extrapolating from our data <clears throat> from the UK, <clears throat> excuse me, from the UK equities market uh, to global equities markets, 0.42 basis points adds up to about $5 billion per year in global, uh, global equities markets, just to give a sense of the overall magnitudes uh, at stake in, 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 in these uh, latency arbitrage uh, races. Let me describe, um, I, I see there are a couple questions flashing, so you can pause here, or pause after I describe the data. Let me describe our data in a, in a few slides, and then maybe I'll take a, a pause, but Bjorn, feel free to interject or uh, if, if now would be a better time to stop. Let me no, describe our data. You, so, can, you can go on. Oh, thanks. So, so this, is a, this is a depiction of the London Stock Exchange's exchange architecture. Um, and this, this exchange architecture is relatively representative of, of other, other exchange architectures that we were able to understand. This, is pe this depiction of the LSE's exchange is pieced together from a combination of public documents and uh, private, meetings, uh, private meetings with the LSE conducted as part of, part of this study. And they're very forthright in helping us understand, uh, un understand everything. Um, so this, this green line depicts a message on the way into the exchange from a trader. So this is a trader one sending a message, for example, to post a new order to the book or to, you know, to, to, to try to take a, an order that's posted in the book. Um, and this message traverses through, through a firewall, uh, then through a, a gateway. 
um, and makes its way ultimately to the exchange's matching engine, which you see here. And this is what we think of as you know, the exchange actually processing, uh, processing orders and cancels and so forth. The matching engine then spits out um, outbound messages, um, spits out an outbound message that makes its way back to trader one, informing that trader of the outcome of their, uh, of their message. Uh, and this would co come back through gateways and back to uh, back to Trader One. If this, if Trader One's message resulted in a trade with another party, uh, the matching engine would also generate an outbound message that went to that uh, to that other party as well. Um, our data is captured um, right in front of the exchange firewall. It's a, it, it, it's an optical capture point. And what, what this means practically is this is the point, if you think about the system's architecture, this is sort of like the finish line in a, in a race, in a speed sensitive trading opportunity, where if trader one and trader two are trying to execute the same trade at the same time, this point is the moment at which the message uh, leaves their control and reaches the exchanges, um, exchanges system. So you think this, the, this is where the LSE happened to, to capture, uh, capture message traffic for, a, for an internal reporting function that they had. Um, but this we think is the right, right place to measure uh, timestamps uh, for the purpose of, uh, of uh, measuring races. I don't think this is a deal breaker for a subsequent analysis if the timestamps aren't in this location, but we think this is a, a nice feature of our analysis. So as, as you could surmise from the previous diagram, Working through this data requires taking combinations of inbound and outbound messages and translating that message activity into market events. Uh, so we call this event classification. So for example, a new order that posts to the book will comprise of a, a new limit order on the way in and a new order accepted message on the way out that just says your order was posted to the book. Uh, if you go to the bottom uh, bottom row of this table, a failed immediate or cancel order, and these, these orders are, are central to our study, uh, would consist of a new order on the way in that was flagged immediate or cancel, so execute it immediately or else cancel it. Uh, and then on the way out, the matching engine would send a, a failure message called order expire in our data that says this message was not able to aggress against the uh, the limit order book at the time that it reached the, the matching engine. Uh, just above, you see a failed cancel message. This will consist of a cancel message on the way in and a cancel reject on the way out, whereas a, a cancel that's accepted is a cancel message on the way in and a cancel accept message on the way out. So, so sets of inbound messages and outbound responses together tell us uh, what happened, uh, what happened uh, in, in the market. We're then going to use this data to measure latency arbitrage races. So let me on this slide um, describe the components of a latency arbitrage race as distinct from traditional uh, Gloston Milgram style informed trading based on privately observed uh, information. So we think it's got four, uh, four characteristics. So first, um, it's a race and multiple market participants acting on the same symbol price inside. And this will be easy to, easy to define uh, programmatically, right? Just multiple participants, same symbol price inside. Uh, second, at least some of whom are aggressing in the race and potentially some of whom are seeking to uh, cancel stale quotes. Third, some succeed, some fail in the race. I'll define these, these criteria you know, a bit more formally in, in a moment. But we have in mind that in, in a race, some, some firms win the race and some firms lose the race. You know, some get, get bounced back with a failed IOC message or a failed, uh, failed cancel message. Uh, and then fourth and most, most subtly or trickily or you know, hardest to measure is, uh, is that all, this, all of this activity occurs at the quote, uh, quote same time. Now, the first three conditions, uh, the first three items or criteria of a race are relatively straightforward for us to implement. So multiple market participants, same symbol price inside, well, we, we have participant IDs, we have symbol price inside information, that's, that's easy. At least some of whom are aggressing, we can 
uh, to detect a race to buy at 12, we can, we can look for orders that are aggressive with respect to, with respect to an offer at 12. That, that's, so that's easy. Some succeed, some fail. So we'll, we'll go through a, a few different uh, ver variations on, on the theme of how to measure successes and fails. But the, the, the main one is a success is a, a message that either aggresses against the order book or successfully cancels, uh, cancels a quote. And a fail is a message that uh, fails to cancel or fails to, fails to take. So in a, essentially a failed IOC or a failed, um, uh, a failed cancel message. There, there's also some cases where uh, a limit order that fails to aggress, we will count as a, as a fail and we do some sensitivities around that. It turns out not to be a very big component of races. And then, then fourth uh, and most, most difficult, I mean, the most difficult is the, this idea of all of the activity happening at the same time. So in, in a theory model, there can be a, a precise thing as messages being sent at the same time. Because you can write down a game theoretic model where there's a notion of stuff happening at the same, people either act at the same time or they don't. In data, no two things happen at exactly the same time. So if we define the same time as literally the same millionth of a second, uh, then we'll find you know, very, you know, very few, few races. Uh, if we define, if we define all at the same time too inclusively, so within the same second, um, then we're going to count as races um, some activity that that isn't a latency arbitrage race. So we have to figure out a way empirically to to define what constitutes um, acting at the same time. And I'll go over the two methods we have for this on the on the next slide. Again, the subtle the the difficulties in theory. There's clearly such a thing as at the same time, and in data, no two things happen at exactly the same time. So the main approach we take, we call the um, information horizon method. And this is meant to be very conservative. Um, we, we define it as the, the information horizon, as the amount of time such that we can be sure that message two is not responding to message one. So what do I mean by this? So the, let's say message, I'm, I'm actor one. I send a message, uh, message to the exchange to, to take a, a stale quote. And Bjorn all is going to be message two. So we're going to first measure how long did it take the matching engine to process my message. So what, what was the, the difference in timestamps between my message on the way in and my same message, the, the outbound response on the way out? Remember, we, we capture, capture data and timestamps at the same place on the way in and the way out, so right outside the exchange's firewall. So that's the, that's the latency with which the, the system processes my, my message. Think of it as like a round trip. And then we add to that the minimum observed reaction time in our data, uh, the, the minimum amount of time between uh, messages on the way out and subsequent responses on the way in that we can statistically detect our responses to that outbound uh, message activity. And in our data, the, the median observed amount of time that, uh, from M1 in to M1 out, so the amount of, essentially the amount of time the system takes to process a message is 157 uh, microseconds, 157 millionths of a second. Um, and then the minimum reaction time that we detect is, is 29 millionths of a second. So we're going to say that two messages uh, are sent at the quote same time if message two couldn't possibly have seen um, the outcome of message, uh, of message one. Um, and then we'll truncate this above, ju just in case the matching engine is particularly uh, slow at, at a moment in time, I mean, relatively speaking slow, uh, we'll truncate this above at 500 millionths of a second. This was in, uh, a, a figure we determined in consultation with FCA supervisors, and this binds a, a little bit of the time, 4%. The other approach we're going to take to defining at the same time uh, is to use a sensitivity analysis. And we'll just con consider a wide range uh, from 50 millionths of a second uh, up to three thousandths of a second. So from 50 microseconds to three milliseconds. And we'll define two messages as being sent at the same time if they're sent uh, within, within this window. And let me say for a moment what I think is 
going to be missed by the information horizon method. It's really, there's two, two senses in which it's conservative and we might miss activity that in fact is, um, is a latency arbitrage race. So one case is if the second participant is racing on the same signal or on so a, a very similar signal, but just happens to be slower than the information horizon that we measure at that moment in time. So a race where the two participants in a race are just further apart um, than, this, uh, than this time horizon. And then second would be a race in which the second participant actually sees that, that they would in principle have responded to the same information signal with, with a similar response or with an aggressive order. But by the time they, they figure out to race on that information signal, they've already seen M1 out and, and, and don't bother. Um, so depending on how you conceptualize a race, you know, we're going we're to miss, we're going to miss that kind of uh, arguably speed sensitive uh, activity as well. So we should just keep that in mind as we interpret, uh, interpret the races we do, we do find. Let me, I think now might be a good time to pause, uh, pause for question, uh, one more time for questions. Uh, so let me see if there are any. Sure, sure. So, uh, uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, this is very interesting and uh, we can tell that the audience thinks so because we accumulated quite a few questions uh, now and um, a couple of them are philosophical. Uh, there's a question by uh, Kumar Ven Kataraman and uh, Sean Foley and Terry Hendershot have already chipped in with answers, but I'll ask it to you anyway to hear your view. Uh, so speed racing, uh, within quotation marks, is between a small set of HFT firms. Mm -hmm. They win some, they lose some. Is this economically relevant for market quality? And I have a steel quote in the book, and Bjorn is aggressing against me, and Bjorn wins. That imposes, uh, it trades are zero sum, so Bjorn wins at my expense. That imposes a cost on my, um, uh, on my, um, on, on me as a liquidity provider. Um, so if I'm ultimately trying to provide liquidity to non-HFTs, uh, Bjorn's uh, sniping made it more expensive uh, for me to do so. Um, second is suppose uh, I'm, my quote is in the book um, and I'm slow or I'm not, I'm not f fast at the levels we're, we're measuring. I'm, maybe I'm a sophisticated market participant, but I'm not the cutting edge. Um, and Bjorn and Terry and, and Marius are all racing to, uh, to, to snipe my steel quote. And one of them wins. Uh, they win at, at the expense of a, of a slower market participant who had a steel quote in the book. And that imposes a cost as well um, on, um, on, a, on a liquidity providing quote. And um, we, we have, um, so we had a good conversation about, uh, let me, I, I see there's a question from Terry uh, Hendershot about races with, uh, with no cancels. Um, and I'm going to get to those results in detail over the next few slides. I actually have some new analysis on that uh, comment we got from Terry and Joel Hasbrook um, in late January. You know, things, are, it, things are slow these days to, to do analysis and to, to get approval to share analysis. Unfortunately, I can't show it, show this, show the results to you today, although I we actually just got it approved this morning. So we put to show it within the next, hopefully within the next week or so, but it, I, I unfortunately can't, um, can't show you the slides today. Um, but I'll, I'll come. I'll come to that question um, uh, in a in a bit. Um, another related result that kind of is about the effect of, on market quality is we're able to measure uh, realized the realized spread in races, um, and we're able to show. I, I can't speak to the specifics of the results because they're not clear yet. But we're able to show that the realized sp spread in races is is quite negative, both for um, slower participants, as you'd expect, but also for the very fast participants. So, so b being the steel quote that gets taken in a race is expensive, whether you're fast or fast or slow. So it's kind of I, I think of that as evidence that's consistent with 
the idea of race is imposing a cost on liquidity provision. One distinction we see in the data is that the fast participants are a lot more likely to try to cancel than the slower participants. Uh, but I, I, again, I'll have that data to, to show you more fully after hopefully within a week. It's been a, a thing, things, have, things got slowed down by coronavirus. Um, so let me, uh, let me, are there other questions? Yeah, that I yeah, I have uh, another question. Speaking of being slowed down, uh, Marius Troikan has a question. Uh, if uh, congestion isn't a factor to keep in mind here as well, uh, if many messages arrive at the same time, uh, he would expect the engine to be slower as well. Yeah, that's a great, a great question. Let me actually slip a uh, slide back to the, the diagram one more time. So what we're going to do, I should have, I should have clarified exactly this issue. We're going to measure all of our data right here. And when we, when we define messages as participating in a race together, we're going to, um, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to perform that definition with respect to the timestamps of the inbound messages. So let's say there's, there's three firms aggressing the same, against the same quote at the same time, and their inbound messages arrive to this point at very similar, at a very similar point in time, but because of the burst of activity, the matching engine is slow. The outbound messages might take some time to manifest, but we're going to capture that the three inbound messages were sent at approximately the same time, and we're all of our uh, all of our work is really re we're working with the inbound messages, using the outbound messages to infer what happened to that inbound message. So an, an inbound message alone doesn't tell me whether it was a success or a fail. I have to look at the subsequent outbound message, but I'm going to use the inbound message as the participation in the race object so as you know the object that participates in a race um so so if 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 a burst of activity slows down the matching engine we'll we'll be we'll be we'll be fine on that uh, on that uh issue uh, there's also a question from ryan davis uh, that may be referring to the bandwidth on, on the trader side so the question is from the perspective of a single trader does participation in one race cause them to be slower on another race? And if so, what sort of strategies do you observe about race choice? Uh, that's a great question. So let me give a more general caveat about our study. So we, we used Section 165 authority to obtain data from the London Stock Exchange. Um, but I'm not going to go into the details of that authority, but uh, it gives a... It, it gives the Financial Conduct Authority the right to obtain data, including for research, that is relevant to policy questions of interest to the FCA. A policy question of interest is quantifying latency arbitrage. We're, we're not, we don't use the data for kind of a general fish, generalized fishing expedition for really understanding nuances of high frequency trading strategies. It'd be interesting to do so, but we're, we don't do that. It's not commensurate with the purpose of the of the regulatory request for data. And then the, I, I saw also there's a question from Jim Angel about the, 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 the data. It would be great if more regulators and more exchanges made message data available. If anyone from the SEC is listening, someone should do this study for the US stock market. Uh, it's been, it's been a many, many years of controversy around high frequency trading and we're the first study to use this data. And that shouldn't be so, right? It, it, so someone, other regulators and other exchanges should make this data available for, for study. All right, let me, let me press forward because I realize we're, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, going, we're actually taking, we've taken up a lot, 30 minutes already. So I want to make sure I get yeah. through the actual results. Um, all right, so the, I've defined the number, the, the way we, we find, uh, obtain races. The, for the FTSE 100, there's an average of 537 races per symbol per day, which is about one race per symbol per per minute uh, it's about one race per seven or eight minutes uh for the FTSE 250 i'm just going to close the chat so i can focus on my slides um let's see um this is data on the duration of races so this is measuring the time between the first success in a race and the first uh fail in a race uh, measured in microseconds 
um, you'll see this hump around uh, between zero and 15 millionths of a second. That's the mode of the distribution. Again, this is the difference in the timestamps of the inbound message activity. Um, there's a, then, then a lot of mass to the right, um, especially up to 50 and a bit up to 100, 100 millionths of a second kind of trails off. Um, and there's also some mass to the left of zero. These are races where the, the, the successful message in, in the race actually arrives to the outer wall of the exchange architecture just after a failed message in the race, but they, they get processed by different gateways. And so the success, the, the successful message makes it to the matching engine first. There's a, you know, a little bit of randomness in the LSE systems, if you will. I don't think that that's economically important in the same way that if, I, if you choose the wrong queue at a supermarket, I mean, that's, you know, there's, there's just some randomness, randomness in that, but it, it speaks to how fast these races are. About 4% of races have negative duration measured this way. Um, this is data on the percentage of volume in races. So about 22% of FTSE 100 volume and 21% of FTSE 100 trades uh, take, place, uh, take place in races. Um, this is data on the number of participants and messages in races. And I, I should have said all, by the way, a, a, a couple of slides ago, the way, we, the way I'm gonna present data in this talk and the way we do it in the paper is I'm gonna emphasize means, but we're gonna show, no one's ever studied this data before, so we're just gonna show the data. We're gonna show, um, show a wide distribution of percentiles uh, uh, for any data element uh, of interest. So this is data on the number of participants in a race. Um, to, to keep things apples to apples across races with different uh, matching engine latency because of the issue uh, Mario Soikin asked about, what we're gonna do is just count the number of messages in the T amount of time after the first success, after the first message in a race. Um, so if you, if you bring your eyes to this 500 microseconds row, Within 500 microseconds of the start of a race, on average, there's 3.27 participants who on average send 3.07 take messages uh, and who on average send uh, 0 0.4 uh, cancel messages. This relates to the question uh, Terry asked in the, in the chat about how, how most of the message activity we see in races is aggressive as opposed to uh, cancel. So we have some new results that relate to that. This is data on the... Um, um, sorted by firm, uh, ranked based on the percentage of races that each firm wins, uh, data on the number, on the percentage of races that each firm both wins and loses. So for example, this first firm, and again, the firm IDs are anonymous. I don't know who's who. Uh, but the first firm ranked by share of races one wins a little bit over 20% of races and loses a little bit less than 20% of races. The top three firms together win a bit over 50% combined and lose a bit over 50% combined. Uh, the top six firms win, win I said these numbers earlier, win 87 and lose 82% if I have the numbers correct in my head. And then, then there's a, a tail of firms that win a smaller uh, percentage in this, in this figure. Um, this is data on race profits, uh, all marked to market, uh, 10 seconds out from the time of the uh, the time of the race, the the mean race is worth, as I said earlier, half a tick, uh, a little bit less than two basis points, and a little bit less than two uh, two British pounds. You see a tail, but even even at the 90th percentile, races aren't worth huge amounts of uh, huge amounts of money per uh, per race. Um, this is data on race profits by, for different mark-to-market uh, time horizons. Um, and you see the, the, the profits materializing, you know, building, you know, getting, getting into prices within between one second and 10 seconds. It's a bit faster for FTSE 100, a bit slower for FTSE 250. Um, I'll show you this, this same data in a, a more illustrative way on the, on the next slide. So at, at one millisecond, you can see uh, we strip out all the zeros. You can see there's a lot of races that by a millisecond are already uh, profitable, meaning the, the midpoint, um, the, the price in the race is now, uh, a tr it, it, the, the difference between the price in the race and the midpoint one millisecond out means that the, the race price is profitable for the, the race winner. Um, a lot of races are still worth negative amounts at, at a millisecond. 
all of this mass is races that, essentially all of this mass is races that haven't yet covered the half spread. Um, so the so price impact is weekly positive, um, but the race isn't profitable yet for the winner. As you go up in time from 10 to 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, up to 10 seconds and so forth, on average, the distribution is moving, uh, moving to the right. Um, but there's still a fair amount of mass to the left of zero. These are races where the winner doesn't recover their, their half spread. Um, uh, and by 100 seconds, there's a you know, significant amount of noise uh, in, this, in this data. Um, this is profits per symbol per day measured in British pounds, um, about 1,000 pounds per FTSE 100 symbol per day. This data is a bit hard to interpret. Um, so the way a more interpretable figure is, I think, to take profits uh, normalized by trading volume. Um, so in the full sample, profits divided by trading volume is about 0.42 basis points. Um, a theoretically more appropriate measure is to take race profits divided by non-race trading volume. I'll show you why in a few slides. And that's a bit over half a basis point. Um, race profits correlate strongly with volume and volatility. Um, you can see that in this plot. In March 2020 was probably a really good time uh, to be uh, to, to be a high frequency trader. Um, once you control for volume, so once you take race profits divided by volume, so plot the latency arbitrage tax against volume and volatility, uh, it's pretty flat in our data. Um, so let me now quantify latency arbitrage's share of the market's cost of liquidity. I'm going to do this in in two uh, two conceptually distinct but you know, related ways. So first is a traditional bid-ask spread decomposition. So you all recognize this kind of um, a, a spread decomposition where the spreads decomposed into price impact and a realized spread. Um, using theory uh, in, a, in my paper with um, Robin Lee and John Shem, which takes the, the BCS model and it's mostly about a competition between exchange, stock exchanges and the economics of of stock exchanges, but one enhancement to the BCS model is it adds traditional uh, uh, tr trading based on traditional adverse selection, based on you know, private information. Using this characterization of the equilibrium bid-esque spread, we get a, a novel spread decomposition that takes the effective spread, splits it into price impact in and out of race, um, and then adds something we call loss avoidance. So if I'm a liquidity provider and I avoid getting sniped, I, that's a, that, that avoided loss is, is part of, conceptually should be part of the latency arbitrage prize. That's a, a fast liquidity provider's compensation for their opportunity cost of not being a sniper in, in, in equilibrium. This turns out to be pretty small in the data, but it's conceptually correct to, to include. So this is the, the spread decomposition we obtain. And then this is data that just implements that spread decomposition. Again, show you means. The mean effective spread in our data is about three basis points. It's very similar in race and not in race. Um, so the, the spread isn't selecting on whether there's a race about to happen. Uh, price impact is different in race and not in race. It's a little bit over five basis points in race, about three basis points not in race. Loss avoidance, as I mentioned, is small. So the realized spread in races is about negative two uh, two basis points. And as I alluded earlier, it's it's pretty similar if you condition on whether the firm that got taken in the race is, is a fast HFT, is in that top six or not. Um, mm -hmm. Price impact in races is about a third of total price impact and about a little bit over a third of the effective, uh, effective spread. The second approach we take is to quantify what would be the reduction in the market's cost of liquidity in a counterfactual market that eliminated latency arbitrage. This could be frequent batch auctions uh, or an asymmetric a speed bump kind of mechanism, for example. Formally, what we seek to measure is the reduction in the equilibrium bid-ask spread. It's expressed as a proportion. And we do a fair amount of algebra, but you know, just algebra. And that enables us to express this proportional reduction in the spread using a ratio that's empirically implementable. The ratio is race profits divided by the effective spread paid in all non-race trading. Um, so this, this again relates to what, what's the latency arbitrage tax if you strip out volume uh, in race. This is, that's the correct measure to use in the denominator here. And we have this ratio in pounds and also in, in basis points. So latency arbitrage tax against the non-race effective spread. 
And that ratio uh, in our full sample is about 17%. It's a bit higher for FTSE 100 stocks than for FTSE uh, 250 stocks. And this is because the effective spread is just much wider for FTSE 250, uh, FTSE 250 stocks. It's hard, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot more adverse selection in those, in those stocks we find. Um, the last thing we're going to do is extrapolate from these results to obtain estimates of the total sums at stake. So we'll do this. So on this slide, I'm going to show you a regression of latency arbitrage profits on just volume and on volume and volatility. The volume and volatility model gets a slightly better fit. Um, volatility is expressed in, a, in, a, in an object that allows you to translate it into basis points. Uh, if volatility is 10 on a day, you'd sum the 0.33 plus the 6.6, so about 0.40 basis points. Um, these are two models that we can bring to our data. Using these two models, um, we get to latency arbitrage profits in the UK equity market, of about 60 million pounds per year. And you see in the bottom row across the, 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 the various models, 60 million in the volume only model, a bit lower if we also control for volatility. And then, as I mentioned, we do a wide variety of sensitivity analyses, the most conservative of which um, looks at races that were the were same time is defined as 50 millionths of a second, the most inclusive of which are same time uh, defined as within a millisecond, for example. Um, and even that most inclusive scenario is going to miss uh, races where the second participant doesn't bother because they were too slow. Um, but this gives you, gives you a range down to 20 million uh, and up to 100 million in the UK, uh, in the UK equity market. Again, see the, the paper for the, ver the specifics of the sensitivities. When we take the same uh, analysis and extrapolate it globally, get to a little bit less than $5 billion per year using the volume only and volume volatility model across the range of sensitivity analyses uh, from 1.7 billion per year to 8.4 billion per year. This, I think, gives a credible sense of magnitudes. Obviously, it would be a lot better to have message data from more exchanges than just the London Stock Exchange. We could replace this table with something a lot more precise if other regulators would obtain uh, message data or if exchanges would make it available. Let me talk about the magnitudes for just a, just a slide. And I think, I think quite honestly that whether the magnitudes in this study seem big or small depends on the the vantage point you look at them from. So the sense in which they're small is the cost per transaction, I think, is, is economically, uh, economically small. Is it, um, it's roughly half a tick per race, a roughly half basis point tax on trading. Um, this is an opinion, but it doesn't sound, uh, doesn't sound alarming. At the same time, it adds up because of the 20% the of volume that takes place in races, it adds up to significant sums. Um, a 17% reduction in the cost of liquidity is, is undeniably a meaningful quantity for large, uh, large investors. And $5 billion per year in, in equities alone, so not, not even counting all of the other financial assets that trade on electronic limit order books, um, that's significant dollars per year, which if you take a net present value is, is really significant val uh, dollars in, in latency arbitrage. I think this is, these magnitudes are consistent with aspects of, of both the myth claim and the rig claim. So the, the numbers real, genuinely are small enough that ordinary households um, shouldn't worry about latency arbitrage in the context of their retirement decision. I think that, that's kind of obvious. And that, in that sense, um, Michael Lewis's claims on 60 Minutes that the market is rigged and individual investors should be alarmed about it that second part, I, you know, I, I think he overstepped, and the, the rigged is an inflammatory word, but the, 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 the statement that individual households should be alarmed about this with respect to their own investing, I think was incorrect given the data in our study. Um, at the same time, it's billions of dollars a year for a very small number of firms uh, who then are gonna have significant incentive to preserve uh, the status quo. And this, this does, if you squint, you can see the word rigged in, in these facts. Um, again, the, the word's inflammatory. Um, so let me, let me summarize the, the, the paper. So this paper makes three intellectual contributions. So first is the methodology using message data to measure latency arbitrage. 
Uh, second is the set of facts on the frequency of races, the 20% of volume uh, in races, the speed of races, so the five to 10 millionths of a second, the concentration of race winners and losers, the per race profits, and then the overall, uh, overall sums at stake. And then third, there, there's this pair of theoretical quant contributions that enables us to quantify latency arbitrage as a proportion of the overall cost of liquidity. So the, the third of the effective spread and the 17% reduction in a counterfactual market design that eliminates latency arbitrage. Some hopes for future research. So one is to better understand the sources of races. So what proportion arise from the same symbol in a different venue? Uh, what proportion arise from a correlated but distinct asset within the same asset class or across asset classes, across geographies? What, what, what proportion come from news? Um, second, I think our main hope is just more studies using message data. Um, I think US equities would be of particular interest. One, just it's an important and large market. Two is the role of exchange traded funds. So e ETFs are highly correlated to the, the constituents. They're also often highly correlated to um, a futures contracts. So there's a lot of potential latency arbitrage related to ETFs. Uh, and then the level of fragmentation, I think, would make for uh, give some richness to, to, to studying the US equities market. Um, more asset classes would be interesting to include. Again, ETFs, futures, currencies, treasuries, all of the different assets that trade on electronic limit order books that are uh, vulnerable to, to latency arbitrage. Um, the hard part of such a study is getting the data. Um, the analysis itself, as you can see, is relatively straightforward. It's, it's very time intensive, but uh, relatively straightforward conceptually. And our code is um, going to be made publicly available once the paper's published and regulators and researchers who want it sooner should just uh, get in touch with us. Uh, last slide, you know, to our knowledge, most regulators don't even capture message data from exchanges. Exchanges seem to preserve it somewhat inconsistently. And we hope this is going to change. So the limit order books historically been viewed as the official record of what happened in the market, but message data and especially uh, error messages that indicate a particular participant has failed uh, in, a, in, in their request are really key to understanding uh, speed sensitive trading. So let me let me pause it there. I'm delighted to take questions uh, for as long as as long as you all have them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Eric. This is a very very nice paper you have and nice data. Um, we have many questions lined up, and uh, I haven't had time to ask all of them. But we're we're opening the the Q and A session now, where you can raise your hand. So uh, uh, those of you who typed questions before, please uh, raise your hand and I'll let you in. And uh, Eric has uh, promised to stay on for an extra 15 minutes after we yeah, as, as officially long as, close. Yeah, as long as, long as you like is fine. I, uh, unless, unless my kids come yelling at me, I'm, I'm, I'm good <laughs> as long as you like. Yeah, so uh, uh, let me uh, start with inviting uh, Thierry Foucault uh, uh, to ask his question. Great, thank you. Uh, Thierry? Eric? Uh, that's, a, that's a great paper, very interesting. Um, so I have a question. I, I think for those races, it's very important to, uh, to, to, to think about what you mentioned at the end, the sources of the, of the race. In the case of the FTSE 100 stocks, uh, one possible reason is that those stocks are traded on various markets in Europe, for instance, uh, BATS or CDOE, you know. So that means you may have situation in which the quotes across the two markets are, are crossed. So just a straightforward arbitrage opportunities. And my question is whether all those arbitrage opportunities are bad for those who are the source of the arbitrage opportunities. It's very likely that in some cases, the quotes are crossed because in one market, there is a guy who really needs liquidity from people in the other market. And in reacting very fast you know, to those situations, what arbitrages do is that they just provide liquidity. And in this case, what you interpret as a cost the cost of adverse selection is just the payment for, uh, for liquidity provision by the arbitrageur. So I think in thinking about whether we'd like to suppress those races and what are the costs of those races for, for the market as a whole, it's very important first to think about why, why those arbitrage opportunities happen in the first place. Is this news and stake quotes or is this just uh, demand for liquidity? by traders in various markets at the same time. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. So one, so one thing, it's it one thing. It's not because this would have shown up in the effect of spreads. Is it's not an investor posting an order that they know will elicit a burst of activity from high frequency trading firms, because that would then manifest as the effect of spread being differently, uh, being different in race versus out of race. We we can't tell whether let, let's go over the the kind of cross market arbitrage scenario that you outlined and then how, how we think conceptually about it. Um, so let, let's use, um, let's use S&P 500 futures ETF arbitrage like in, in, the, in the last paper. Um, the, there's, an, a, there's a trade in the S&P 500 futures that creates a race to snipe steel quotes in the ETF. So there is kind of an intrinsic mystery of why why the firm that didn't that that caused the S and P five hundred futures price to trade to, to move didn't simultaneously correct all mispricings across all correlated assets uh, in 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 all financial markets and that's a and that's a it's an empirical fact that there there were mean mispricings that get sniped but I think I think it's a genuine question you raise. Um, that we're not able to answer. What we can say, though, is that the the race to snipe the stale quote in the ETF or you know in a in a stock on the London Stock Exchange um, harms the liquidity provider because they traded a price that soon becomes uh, soon becomes stale. Um, so, and I think um, I, I think that, yeah, I think that's kind of the, the the main answer I would give. The other thing I'd mention is in in the context of our data specifically, the London Stock Exchange is um, Peter and Mateo will correct me if I get this wrong, but about sixty percent of volume um, in, in in the UK equities market at the time of our data. Um, so it, it's it's not going to be the S and P five hundred you know, lead lag relationship. The London Stock Exchange kind of is the uh, is is the biggest uh, biggest market in these symbols? I think it'd be really interesting to do our study in in other assets, in other markets, and other asset classes. So I hope I hope that answers answers your question. I'm happy to talk talk more either now or uh, offline. Thank you. Thanks. Good. So uh, the next question is by uh, Albert Menkwert. Hi, Eric. Uh, great, uh, great talk as always. Uh, enjoy your thank you, uh, Albert. Your um, your research and and the way you think about markets. Uh, two two things came up uh, while you were talking. One was um, yes, it, if public news um, is the um, is the cause of the uh, of the race, uh, and to the extent that public news clusters. Um, could the response of non-HFTs be to trade at times when there's not a lot of news and therefore avoid paying the cost that HFTs then impose among uh, each other? Um, and I was thinking that maybe the way to, to analyze this, and uh, you, you might have thought about it yourself, is so what happens around earnings announcements where there's a lot of news coming out from the company? Uh, do uh, your Since you have identity, do the people who... who um, who typically do not participate in these races then uh, stop trading and, and wait for times that it's quiet so that, that they avoid paying the uh, the, the, the cost uh, that the uh, that the friction you have in focus uh, um, um, uh, institutes uh, on, on on all um, so that was one and the other one was um, there was a when you published this uh, this study and you're very good at at the outreach, uh, so, so it's, it's 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 nice to have to, it fired up the conversation here, at least in Europe, among regulators and, and industry, uh, on wow, what what's this and and what are, what are large numbers, uh, you know, if you aggregate it and and um, and, uh, and and is this all? Um, uh, do we believe this or, or or what do we make of this? So I, I was I would like to hear what um, what specific feedback you got from you know non-academics on this study when you released it and, and and whether you you think it makes sense or it made sense or not i'll stop here uh, yeah so let me um so the the first question let me answer the first question succinctly which is my I, we, so we don't we don't do any analysis to try to get at the source of races my in, my instinct would be most ra most races are caused by public news in the sense of a change in the 
a, a change in the price of a related asset or activity in the market for a related asset or the same asset at a different venue as distinct from news in the sense of, a, of an earnings announcement. Just because news, news in an earnings announcement is just comparatively so rare. Right? We're finding a race per symbol per minute. There isn't news per symbol per minute in financial markets. It's just, so it, it's almost got to be that it's dis, almost, disproportionately just financial data causing uh, causing races or pr pricing data as opposed to news news in the traditional sense. Um, on the on the feedback that the paper got, um, so one I mean I we'll, we'll 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 put out our response to um, to the to the main pieces of feedback. Hopefully any day now. It's just been. Uh, everything's been a bit slow, but one one question that came up a lot was uh, better. The, the word tax, I think, had a the latency arbitrage tax. I think that word. Um, a lot of people asked about the use of of that word. So, is, is it fair to to describe the point uh, forty two basis points, which I think is a reasonably small number? Um, as a tax on liquidity provision. So we've done a fair amount of analysis to try to, um, and a fair amount of writing work to try to explain that, that usage better. Um, the main new piece of analysis I alluded to earlier was that the realized spread for, for the quotes taken in races is meaningfully negative, whether the trading, whether the participant who gets taken is fast or slow. Relatedly, we find a lot of, a lot of the liquidity taken in races is provided by um, by slow participants. This kind of relates to a, a question Terry Hendershot and Joel Hasbrook asked us in late January. But a the, the the modal race is a subset of firms in the top six who disproportionately take taking from a firm that is not in the top six. That's the modal. And there's a a lot of variations on who who can who takes and who provides. But that that's the modal race in our data. Um, so yeah, I, I think the, the, I mean, if the 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 you you said good at outreach, I don't know if that's meant to be a compliment or an insult, <laughs> but I mean, if 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 I were in charge of how journalists write their stories, I I think I think the numbers that are most interesting in the paper are the 17% potential reduction in the cost of liquidity, the 22% of trading volume that takes place in races, the five to ten millionths of a second duration of races uh, and the concentration of uh, winners and losers that we find. Um, the $5 billion number is a way to give a sense of magnitudes for you. Know, ask, if you ask your colleagues what's 0.42 basis points, even, even in a finance department and even among microstructure experts, they're not really going to be able to translate it into dollars. So I think that, that that number is helpful and I stand by including it in the paper, but that wouldn't be my headline if I were in charge. Thanks, David. It was meant, it was meant as, a, as a compliment because I think we do, all of us do too little of this, you know, engaging. Well, with, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the people throw around the word advocacy as, a, as an insult, and I don't see, think of myself as an advocate. But anyway, the, 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 the Modern Markets Initiative just we put out a statement that said our paper is, is motivated by a manifestly political agenda. You know, they, anyway, let me, let, me, uh, yeah, well. let, me, let me take the next question. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we have exceeded our official one hour time slot. So for everyone who may have to leave now, uh, thanks a lot for tuning in and welcome back next week when we have Mao Yi uh, as a speaker. And uh, we will continue with the Q&A and we have several hands up in here. And the next one is uh, Marius Soika. Uh, hi, thanks Bjorn. Thanks Eric. This is a, this is a great paper, very interesting. Thanks. So it, it, I actually like the fact that you can compute the overall arbitrage race profits. And I was wondering if, if you could benchmark this against the, the revenues that exchanges get from collocation fee. Because they have, I believe they have some, some skin in the game, right? The exchanges, they're yes. capitalizing on the latency race. And it would be interesting to see what percentage of the, of the total buy size they, they actually get. Yeah, no, thanks. That's a, a great question. So it's something I've worked on both theoretically and empirically in, in our paper with Robin Lee and John Shem. So let me kind of briefly advertise what we find there and when the, we're in the prospect, process of, of, of revising that paper. Um, we, um, 
So in, in the US, the, and this is from the US stock market, not, not the UK, but in the US stock market, exchanges earn about a billion dollars of revenue is to order of magnitude from uh, proprietary data feeds and uh, co-location, co-location and connectivity. And that, that, that's stripping out the revenue from the SIP feed, which is about 300 million bucks a year. Um, so about a billion dollars of, of revenue that, you know, some subset of that is, um, is, a, is payment for, it, it, yeah. it is revenue from the, from, for the, the very fastest uh, traders. Um, and, and if you take the 0.42 basis points from this study and port it to the US market, which obviously isn't perfect, it'd be better if we had US message data, that would get to you know, two, two and a half billion dollars a year. So exchanges are, none, neither of those numbers is perfect because exchange data disclosure on revenues from colo and proprietary data isn't perfect. And the, the latency arbitrage size is prize in the US is, you know, we need message data. But that points to exchanges extracting meaningfully north of zero and meaningfully less, you know, arguably less than half of the, of the prize and the, the speed race. But that's okay. that's kind of the best I can do on that on that on that question, which I think is a really interesting one. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. That's good. Thank you. And, uh, the next question is by Marcos Carrera. Yes. Hi, Eric. Thanks for the presentation. Hi, Marcos. So, yes. Yeah, so at Polytechnic, we've been using uh, Hawks process to model the endogeneity of trading, and I think that uh, given that you're saying that well one event which is the, the presence of a, a price discrepancy will trigger a lot of activity by certain participants. I was wondering whether you ever thought about using Hawks processes or something similar to study uh, this kind of race. Yeah, I think that so it sounds very interesting. We, we were, we were I mean, for better or worse, I think, I think genuinely both. We're we're very disciplined in in studying and trying to quantify the frequency and economic stakes in latency arbitrage races, but not trying to explore every um, everything you could possibly explore with this interesting data set. Um, I, I'd have to think a little bit more carefully with you offline as to. Whether there's a way to, um, yeah, I, I would I would want to uh, sort of think through the specific scenario you described offline a bit, uh, if if, okay. if that would be okay with you. Okay, thanks. Next question is by Jim Angel. All right, thank you, um, Eric. Uh, this is a really great paper. I, I think it's very impressive. Uh, what I'm curious about is, can you give us more detail about what the racers are doing when they're not racing? Um, are they uh, mostly adding liquidity? Are they doing nothing? Just, uh, you know, is uh, the profit they make uh, from racing something that is just sort of like an added bonus to their other revenues? Or is it the reason they're there in the first place? Great question. I, I mean, I think the short answer is I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, we, we there in... Oh, goody, that, more research yeah. topics. Yeah, no, look, it, it'd be... This topic's controversial. Um, it'd be less controversial if we had better data with which to um, with which to study it. So I hope I hope someone does exactly the study the study you described. There there is some heterogeneity that we see in our data that I alluded to earlier, and that shows up in a few related a, a few other prior studies that are, we cite in the new version of the paper. You do see some heterogeneity. With, within the six firms that win 85% or so of races, um, there are two clear types. One type is disproportionately aggressive, maybe four to five, four or five to one ratio. And one type is closer to 50-50 between aggressive um, and, and liquidity provision. I think it's 40, maybe 60-40 aggressive to liquidity provision, if I'm remembering correctly, but I might have that flipped. Um, and that's data from races. We didn't systematically study non-race uh, non trading, but I think the, the intuition you get from other studies is that 
there's heterogeneity across firms where some specialize in aggressing, some um, more specialize in liquidity provision. Um, in our data, the, the firms that are the most provide the fast firms that provide the most liquidity also do a fair amount of sniping, but there are some firms that almost you know, are, are more like four or five to one ratio of sniping to, to getting to, to liquidity provision in races. Now, do you think any of those major racers are um, basically buy side algos trying to execute efficiently, or do you think they're all basically just prop traders? Um, so I, I, I essentially don't know. I, I mean, the, the, the firm IDs and participant IDs are all anonymized. So I think the, it, would be, it would be careless to speculate. I, I genuinely just don't know the answer to that. The next question is by Mao Yi. Oh, hi, Eric. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, hi, Mao. Oh, just... okay, okay, uh, great. Actually, uh, now I have two questions. The first question actually is a comment to Jim's point. Uh, I believe in your data that these high speed traders, uh, when they do not do sniping, they will participate in other speed races. Uh, there are two types. First one is like a, to secure queue positions when the tick size is large. So if they have speed advantage, they should like provide lots of liquidity for tick constraint stocks. The other one is like after we extend your model uh, with my students, Sida Li and Xing Wang, there's another kind of interesting speed races. It's like a, sometimes like a buy ergos will cross a midpoint. Basically, they uh, provide liquidity at a loss. And these high speed traders actually will race to take liquidity because, uh, because uh, the, uh, the buy algos actually, algorithm traders, it's like they cannot jump ahead of Q. So they actually, they provide liquidity at a very aggressive speed, which gives high frequency trader a profit. And uh, they were participating in this kind of speed races. It's like, means like, suppose some orders uh, cross a midpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, high frequency traders will immediately respond because that's of equilibrium. So this is a comment to uh, uh, Jim's question. I believe uh, if you yeah, look at the data, uh, you probably see other speed raises, right? Well, so let me, let me do the second one first uh, yeah. and, then, uh, and then Q position. So buy algos crossing the midpoint. So here's what that would look like. You have a, you have a wide spread. Here's yeah, a yeah, yeah. And yeah. then someone comes in bid up here and then immediately gets taken. Yes. So that pattern, whereas if, if, if trading that's not generated by that pattern will you know, trade at this spread. So the, the, that pattern of a buy side algo eliciting a race in the way you, the, in the way you model, I agree with the model as a work of theory. Um, I, think it's, it's, I, think, I think it's an, ex, an excellent theoretical model. Um, it doesn't show up in our, it, it doesn't seem consistent with our data because okay. our data, the effective spread is very similar in races and not in races. So that's not to say that there's zero of that buy side algo elicitation, um, yeah. but it doesn't look like the a large enough share of race activity to move the needle on the spread in and out of races. Um, the Q position um, source of race profits, um, I think it'd be really interesting to study. I think it'd be great if someone used message data to study uh, race for Q position. I, we, we don't do it. Um, I think it'd be particularly interesting in, in, in markets, with, you know, the, U, the UK market, the tick size uh, varies with the nominal share price in a you know, relatively sensible way. Um, so it'd be particularly interesting to do the Q size, the, the, the Q position race in, in a market like the US where there's a lot of stocks that are, are quite severely constrained by the penny tick size. I think that'd be a great study for someone to do. We don't the, the our, our magnitudes do not include that source of compensation to speed. Okay, uh, then comes to my original quick question. It's like, uh, it's interesting uh, in your data, you see some orders jump ahead of a queue after submission. That's really interesting. I have two hypotheses. The first one is like, it, uh, is it related to the number of gateways a trader have? And the second one is like, does that relate to the order type different trader to have? Uh, to have, oh, for example, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I get the question. So the, the short answer is I, I don't know. I, um, we didn't, we're, again, we're, we're, there's a lot you could study with this data. We tried to be pretty, pretty disciplined about not going on fishing expeditions. Um, I, my, my instinct is it's not going to be related to order type. My, my instinct is that it, the easiest way to think about it conceptually is it's different cues at the supermarket, that there's, there's different gateways 
we didn't look for you know, people speculate about gateway blasting or whatever. We didn't really look for any of that kind of uh, behavior. Um, so, uh, so I, I, there's, I, I don't, I don't think it's anything more or less interesting than there being a small amount of randomness in how orders get, get processed. But I, I, we, I don't have concrete facts to back up that view. Thank you. Time flies here, Eric. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah. Fire. fire well, this is great. I mean, this is this is. So we this have. Is, uh, this is where I want to be. So as long as you all <laughs> want to be, I'm I'm delighted to be here. Good. Okay, thank so you. So we, we have uh, Peter Dahlström from Stockholm Business School. Hi, Eric. Thanks for a very interesting um, uh, paper. My uh, question is pretty. Uh, simple and it, it, it concerns the classification. So I'm thinking about like a naive um, time weight average price strategy, sending market orders in, uh, in even evenly in clock time, so to speak. Is it a risk that you classify those as um, races? Uh, is there like, um, can you see a pattern in races with regards to clock time, so to speak? Um, oh, interesting. So let me, um... Let me give you a short answer and a slightly longer answer. So the, the short answer is we didn't, a lot of these questions, the answer is we didn't look at that. And I, I'm, I, it's not that it's not really interesting. We just didn't, we didn't look. Um, I think the, 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 so the, the longer answer, one thing we do do that's I think related to the exercise you're describing is we, we do an analysis. It's reported in the paper with more detail in the appendix where we try to quantify um, Given the rate of message arrivals at exchange at, at by by symbol uh, by symbol at the LSE, um, how often would it be the case that n messages arrive within t time if messages arrived independently? So, um, and and the 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 punchline out of that analysis, if you assume messages arrive Poisson, is that bursts of activity in which even two uh, even two or more two messages arrive within the kinds of windows of time that we're we're finding would be extremely rare. So I think I think it'd be you know, two messages within one millisecond would be about I think the mean would be about seven per day for a FTSE 100 symbol, and two messages within 100 microseconds would be you know 0.7 or so per day for the for the average FTSE 100 symbol. Um, so it's not impossible that there will be races by coincidence. That our method would pick up, but it, um, I mean, the, it's 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 so hard to keep in mind just how unfathomably short these races are. Right? The the modal race is five to ten millionths of a second. Yeah. If you add up all of the time in race uh, for the twenty two percent of trading volume in a typical FTSE one hundred stock, it adds up to much less than one second out of the trading day. It's not meant to be a relevant number economically, but it just gives a sense of how. This this stuff isn't. It's not a coincidence. There, it's a not. It's, it's mostly a half a tick. I'm not saying it's some massive. You know, I'm not trying to say anything too conspiratorial. But the but racing behavior isn't. It, it typically isn't. It isn't it would be very unlikely for race behavior to be coincidence. Thanks. Okay. So we yeah, have uh, we have one more question lined up, and I think I'll make that one the last one. And uh, it is from uh, Qi Meng Tang. Great, thank you. Hi, Eric. Thanks very much uh, to you and your uh, colleagues for the, uh, the paper as well as the uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I just had, a, I guess, one quick comment on what somebody, else, somebody said about uh, buy side orders potentially, because uh, buy side orders tend to sit on the order book and then uh, eventually go aggressive. So typically, I guess you could track it by the order ID if you see a you know, order ID moving around and eventually going to take the, most likely a, a buy side order more than, uh, you know, a prop shop order, for example. But my question, uh, there were really two questions. One was, um, was the research uh, essentially done on a gross profit basis or a net profit basis? I wasn't completely clear because if you look at the uh, trading fees on the London Stock Exchange, uh, and since the uh, research was you know basically concentrated there it's clear around you have to trade about probably eight billion uh, 
pounds a month to get something like a 0.4 basis point uh, charge. So essentially, you, if, if it was on a net basis, uh, then it makes sense if it was a gross basis, that um, trading fee essentially erodes completely the, uh, the profitability of the, uh, these trades. Um, yeah, thanks. So, sorry, Go ahead. I asked the second question quickly as well, was that on your uh, chart, basically, you showed the, uh, the top six, top five uh, participants, essentially, uh, that, you know, win and lose. I noticed that the second participant basically lost more than they won. So also the question is, were they basically losing money continuing to do this straight? Oh, so, so the second question is easier. So, so they're losing a race is being the, the, the second participant in the race, not being the, the, the firm that gets taken. We do an analysis in response to feedback we got over January, February, where we look at who takes and who provides in races. It's a, di a different definition of who loses the race, if you will, you know, who's quote, in, in races that result in a trade and 90% mo mo of races result in a trade, 10% of races are won by a cancel. In races that result in a trade, who is the participant who got, who got traded? Um, and that, so I alluded to that earlier when I said the, the modal race is a, a subset of the top six taking from a firm outside of the top six. Right. Okay. Um, Thanks. Um, but it's, um, so it's a, yeah, so the, and, and there, yeah, I think the fir firms that get taken, um, taken in races lose, lose money, um, that they, that they wouldn't lose in a market design without latency arbitrage. Um, and, and again, just to kind of review the, the economics of a, of a batch auction, right? If the market's here and there's some piece of news that creates a sniping race, the competition in an auction drives the price up to a, a level that reflects the public, uh, public signal. So if I'm, a, if I'm a relatively slow participant with a limit order in the book and it's in, a, in a frequent batch auction market and there's a piece of news, I'll, I'll trade, but I'll trade at a price that reflects the new new market clearing price post the public information as opposed to getting to, as opposed to trading because the price just became uh became stale um the um the the question about gross versus net so the way we're the way we compute profits is, <clears throat> is the the price in the race marked to the midpoint so that's gross of <clears throat> excuse me gross of gross of exchange trading fees conceptually the reason for that is that um exchange, this relates a little bit to the question marius asked earlier um ex, for, first of all exchange trading fees are, are pretty small uh, well, I'll, I'll get um uh you mentioned mentioned the way they scale in london stock exchange uh, with volume but second i think more conceptually um ex, Exchange trading fees are a way that exchanges get some of the get some of the prize and speed sensitive trading. Um, so that if you were to if, if if the goal is to quantify the size of the prize in latency arbitrage, it's I think conceptually appropriate to do it gross. If your goal is to quantify the profitability of being the fastest market participant, the appropriate way to do it will be net. I guess my point is basically it was the motivation was profit, then there really isn't because the exchange is actually taking all of the profits. So potentially there is some other motivation around these types of trading. And basically, uh, in essence, there is no latency tax, so to speak. And that P Peter and Matteo, do either of you want to speak to speak to that comment? Because you'll probably know the fee details more sharply than I do. If one of you is there. If, if you want to, uh, Peter or Matteo, you can raise your hand and I can allow you to talk. If not, I'm happy to get back to that. i get back to you offline about that. That's a, a really interesting question. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. So uh, <laughs> I, I think we have to close here and uh, thank Eric uh, for, for this great talk. Uh, very interesting. And thank you for everyone who stayed for the full almost one and a half Hours here. <laughs> thank, yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. I really appreciate you organizing this. Uh, it was a treat. So, pleasure to stay. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day. <laughs>